Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. Now today I'm going to take a break from commercial products, especially DAX that this channel is probably known for. And I'm going to talk about my speakers that I've been using for the last five to six months, I believe. And they are called Spirit Winds. And they're made by using a do-it-yourself project by the late designer Jeff Bugby. And I postponed doing a video on these for quite a bit, uh, but a lot of you asked in the comments, uh, review your spirit winds, please do it. And yeah, here we go. So first, let me tell you a little bit how I actually decided to make this particular project, to use this particular project to make my speakers and why I simply didn't purchase something commercial of a similar price. Well, first, if you know anything about hi-fi industry so far, it's that there are costs that are involved in commercial products that pile up. And when you buy something that's 2000, you paid for it like 2000 US dollars, the bill of materials is usually a quarter of that, like 500. It's not that anybody is robbing you or that the industry is evil. It's just all the costs like labor put into creating that product, then shipping, especially speakers, they, they're often big and heavy, chunky. And then like distributors stocking them, using uh, space to do that, having staff and salons where you can go and listen to all of these speakers and all of those costs pile up. So basically one quarter of the price that we pay for a typical hi-fi speaker costs that much. And me and my friend, we thought about it. We both had CAF speakers. I was using CAF LS50s for several years now, and he used CAF R3, the ones that I reviewed on this channel. We were itching for slightly higher quality speakers, but without paying that price premium that you have to do with commercial products. So we started looking at the DIY projects and we found these Kairos speakers. Those are the different speakers, different projects from the same designer, Jeff Bugby. And that one was really well documented, the whole project, the measurements of the speaker, how he approached the design, he, he is a great designer, in my opinion. Just you can read what he says and notice that he takes care about driver positions and drivers lobbying, creating really good crossovers that are not overcomplicated, but really good and, and uh, tuned to have really neutral flat response. So my friend and I, we first set our eyes on that Kairos project, but then he found the, the Spirit Wind project that was less well documented, but Jeff Bugby himself considered it to be, at the time when he was writing that, his best two-way design. But it was based on much pricier drivers, so it would be a pricier project. So we ask around a little bit uh, for people with first-hand experience with Jeff Bugby's projects, and we actually met a guy here in Serbia that made two pairs of Kairos, and he was amazed with these speakers. He said they did everything right. They sounded neutral and really well balanced with just huge soundstage. And that friend, he's not somebody that's inexperienced. He uses really high quality gear. He also showed interest to create a Spirit Wind because he was that impressed with the Kairos and Spirit Wind is supposed to be even better. So uh, I've decided, and several of my friends, let's take a dive, let's make this project. And we started by contacting Meniscus Audio that actually has the designs needed for making these cabinets and crossover and everything that actually makes a speaker project. 
And this is a shop, uh, parts, speaker parts shop in the US that specializes in do-it-yourself projects. And there you can buy the whole kit without cabinets for Spirit Winds, Kairos 2 and many other speakers. By the way, this is not an affiliate video or anything like that. I have no connections with Meniscus Audio, but they're nice guys because we asked like, hey guys, uh, we are from Serbia and just buying parts from US with hugely expensive shipping, these are weighty drivers by the way, uh, it's not all that uh, reasonable, especially because these drivers are made here in Europe. These are Danish drivers. And we asked, can we just purchase the designs for these speakers, crossover and cabinet designs? And uh, the owner of Meniscus told us, we here, like a company, basically sell parts. We do not charge for a design. It comes free with parts that we sell you. But if you donate something to the family of late Jeff Bugby, we could provide designs only for you. So we did that. Because of that, I give thumbs up to Meniscus Audio because they were really reasonable and forthcoming with us that are not in the US. But for the rest of you, if you're in the US, I think that buying a kit from them together with crossover and cabinet design is probably the best way to go about it. By the way, a little bit more about the project itself and the speaker itself. It uses really high quality, but also pricey drivers. The base unit, mid-base base unit, is the audio technology 18H something like that driver. And then we also have ScanSpeak tweeter. This is also highly expensive tweeter around 250, I believe, in here in Europe, around 250 euros. And we ordered these directly from Denmark because it's much closer to Serbia. But uh, for the US viewers, I suppose that Meniscus Audio is a good choice. They import these drivers and they sell them. Cabinets are made in a professional woodwork shop because I simply have no tool or space to do something like that. So cabinets here are made to high standards. It's basically a sandwich material made from HDF, MDF, then HDF again, I'm not sure, is it three or five layers, maybe, but there's several layers. They're of a different density, making this whole sandwich structure stronger and less prone to resonating. So the majority of, of the cabinet is one inch thick, that's 25 millimeters. But the front panel, the one with the drivers on it, is double that two inches or 50 millimeters. And finally, everything was finished in a real wood veneer. My pair is finished with American walnut veneer and then hand oiled by yours truly with a natural Rubio monocoat oil. I did two coatings and as you can see, the result speaks for itself. I quite like it. And if you're maybe wondering a little bit about the shape of the cabinets, I have to tell you that there is a slight inclination. The panel is tilted back five degrees. That's according to the project. The distance between drivers two is according to the project. You cannot mess with that because Jeff accounted for driver lobbying. Driver lobbying, if you're not familiar with it, is basically drivers influencing each other because uh, when they radiate sound, one driver can actually cancel the sound from another driver. Not completely, but in some frequency parts. And if you're not careful when designing speakers, that can happen. And you can even see dips in the frequency response. You can see that in some commercial speakers. But Bugby here definitely is, is a great speaker designer, in my opinion. So he thought about that. So as I said, cabinets are really thick and big and heavy and sandwiched, so they do not resonate easily. They're reinforced from the inside. Then there are some wooden pyramids lined 
on the walls from the inside so they can actually break down sound waves a little bit. And then in the end, when all of that is done, we added some bitumen filling inside. And of course, the inner volume is carefully calculated according to the project, so we do not deviate from the creator's intention of how this speaker should sound. And finally, coming to the crossover, I'm not going to share the exact values because, as I said, that, that's not my property, that this whole do-it-yourself design is a property of Meniscus Audio, so you have to contact them if you think about building Spirit Wind yourself. But because I really wanted this to be my last speaker for a really, really long time, I've decided to go with a really high quality crossover parts. So for example, capacitors are Janssen. I don't know if it's Janssen or Janssen. Let's roll with Janssen. Silver caps. So these are of a really high quality and basically you won't find that level of capacitors in a commercial product. Maybe only, only in some really high-end uh, speakers, but anything below 10K is no way. For example, if you look at the Burkhardt S400 MK2, that's really praised of having high quality crossover, uh, they're using Janssen cross caps. At, those are nice caps. Then above them, uh, there are Janssen Superior Z caps, a level higher. And then there is Superior Silver Z cap. That's what I'm using. Basically two levels in the Janssen's own line of capacitors uh, above cross caps. Then I used Janssen air coils and uh, the one that's actually in the path of the signal, that's in the base section, that one is of a higher quality. It's a Litz coil in wax. It's really high gauge too. Uh, I know it's 2.5 millimeters squared. I'll put what I think it's a 12 gauge. I'll put on the screen if I don't remember correctly now. And then we are left with resistors. We used some mills that are highly regarded. Those are used for shunts, but in the path of the signal in the tweeter circuitry, because we only have one resistor in the path of the signal, and that's before tweeter, uh, we used path audio. It's a highly praised audio resistor that's supposedly sounds really, really great. But I didn't do my own testing with these parts because buying several brands and trying them out would cost a small fortune. So I read a lot of forums. I listened to a lot of uh, friends and acquaintances that have experience. And I just uh, made an educated guess what would pair well with what and what I want from the sound of this speaker, so I chose components accordingly. And finally, the wiring of the speaker is done with uh, high quality copper that's produced here in Serbia by Andre VBS Audio. He says that it's a single crystal copper and it's some sort of thermically treated copper. He, he has his own formula how he does that. And also the binding posts on the back of the speakers are made by Andre too. Those are again, really high quality, high purity copper, thermically treated once again. I'll put the pictures on the screen. So basically there is no brass used, any sort of nickel plating or anything like that. The whole signal path from binding posts to drivers is high quality pure copper and also crossover parts that are of a really high quality themselves. First, before I go to the impressions part, I was curious, so I used Umic One microphone. I made uh, just measurements from the listening position because I do not have an echoic room or anything like that, so I cannot give you the frequency response of speakers alone, but I can measure 
uh, response in my own listening room. I actually did several measurements in a listening window and then I averaged results that I'll put on the screen. Now, just try to ignore these peaks and dips that you see, the, these edgy like teeth, things looking on the frequency spectrum because that's my room. If I measure any speaker like CAFs, Dynaudios, etc, etc, those peaks and dips are basically the same. They're here because of the room. But that part is not important. It's actually pretty good for, for a normal room that's not like a professionally treated listening or mastering room. What I wanted to share with you is how well balanced is the frequency response of this speaker. In-room response should start uh, from the baseline, lowest baseline that's a little bit, sits a little bit higher than everything else in the spectrum. And then as you go higher and higher in the frequency spectrum, uh, the response gets a little bit lower and a little bit lower. That's like desired in-room curve. And as you can see here, it's happening. And there are no significant big dips or peaks or anything like you can see with many commercial speakers, just like really spiced up highs somewhere or maybe a dip in the mid range. That's something that happens quite often. But also a very interesting thing that you can see here on the graph is that there is no uh, bass hump. Many commercial speakers come with a bass bump, bass hump around 100 hertz. It can be a little bit lower or higher, a narrower or wider, but there's usually a little bit of a bass hump. And that gives a little bit more oomph to the bass and the impression that a speaker, even when it's smaller, sounds bigger and bassier than it really does. Uh, with this speaker and with the Kairos 2 and basically with all his designs, Jeff aimed for a really neutral flat response. And as you can see in my room, I go as low as 35 Hertz with a full force. And you can hear that. This is a really full bassy sounding speaker, even though it's not really all that big. And all that said, you, you, you must be pretty tired by now. It's finally time to make some impressions. When I've started listening to these speakers, what I've noticed first is how actually authoritative they are in the bass. And I'm talking about both really deep bass for a stand mounting speaker but also highly uh, controlled and precise baseline. If you follow my channel regularly, you probably know that uh, maybe a year ago, I paired my CAF LS 50s with RHEL T5X subwoofer. And when I switched to Spirit Winds, I first tried pairing them with a subwoofer too, but it simply didn't work because these could go as low as that small subwoofer could. And even more importantly, the baseline coming from Spirit Winds is quicker, speedier, more nimble and more textured than the one coming from the RAL T5X. So I couldn't get any more extension with that subwoofer that's simply not big and powerful enough to extend the baseline on these speakers, but T5 also couldn't match the sheer speed, quality and resolution of the baseline of Spirit Winds. So it would, no matter what I do and how low I dialed it down, it would muddy the baseline. Something that didn't happen with LS50s because their baseline was not as quick and as resolving as this one. And to be perfectly honest, at the moment, I do not feel like I need more baseline. Uh, going down to like some 35, 40 Hertz in full force, of course, joined with my room and its resonances. It's always like that. We do not listen speakers in uh, unequoic rooms. I have this living room 
and in it and with it the bass line is really deep powerful and rumbly and i do not feel a need for a subwoofer anymore then what i've noticed next is how actually clean the whole sound is all the way from the bass line to the highest frequencies one of the first things that you notice as the result of that is that how deep and clean and spacious the sound stage is. Basically, these speakers have the deepest sound stage that I've ever heard in my place. That's not saying much probably because uh, the highest priced speakers that I had in my place is Dyne Audio Focus 160. But also I visit a lot of audiophiles and I have definitely listened speakers costing up to like 20 Ks. I've rarely, if ever, encountered the sound stage that's this deep and just clean and see-through. And I really like that. I uh, especially like it when it doesn't come with any sort of sharpness or tiring character like listening to edges and those small tiny details is never tiring or artificial sounding with these speakers and i'm especially happy about it because i was a little bit scared of how this particular scan speak tweeter will behave when i was making these at least five friends called me and told me like why did you decide to build that exact project because you know we heard that tweeter it's very aggressive and it's very bright and analytical it's really hard to take the edge of it but in my speakers as basically most of them that visited me after that uh, noticed themselves if anything uh, it sounds a little bit darker and tamer compared to the average commercial speaker. There is no brightness to talk about, there is no splashiness or any sort of cloyness or graininess to talk about. It's just a pristinely clean and detailed high frequency, but it's, it's really tame sounding in some way. And uh, some people that are used to really bright speakers, I had focal owners, I had several other guests that told me it even sounds a little bit dark, a little bit on the dark side of things. Well, that impression is, of course, the, the joint impression of my whole system and my room, and I like using R2R decks, and I like juicy tamer sounding pieces of gear more than those bright forward edgy analytical ones so my whole system sounds like that a little bit but when we directly compared spirit winds to many other speakers yeah that character definitely shows they're highly revealing and highly transparent with a huge see-through sound stage but uh, not bright and not edgy in any way and i believe that the huge part of that is simply competence of jeff bugby that created them he simply made a great crossover and matched these drivers perfectly but building on that is definitely there's definitely some to it because of the parts that i've used like i've mentioned really high quality crossover parts and really high quality copper wiring and binding posts, no brass, no magnetic stuff anywhere. And because of all of that, I believe that this speaker finally sounds really natural, full and, and just naturally revealing without actually ever sounding aggressive, sharp or bright or edgy or anything like that. Now, if this was a normal review, I would have make comparisons to a lot of speakers. But because I do not have commercial speakers that should compete with this one, and by the way, because the bill of materials was around 2,000 US dollars to make this, and because of that story that I told you in the beginning of the video that a bill of materials is around quarter of a price 
of a product when we actually buy a commercial one. My expectations is that you have to think in terms of like six, eight, maybe 10,000 US dollars speakers that would actually compete in terms of build quality, parts quality, just overall sound fidelity with these that are 2000s, but do it yourself. And I didn't even count how many hours I spend on assembling these and oiling them and everything. That would be like labor cost. So if you think just bill of materials is 2000, then you include labor, then like anything else that commercial products needs to have, like advertising, shipping, exhibit salons, etc. Et and you get the gist. But I don't have such expensive speakers at my disposal, so I can tell you only how it compares with something I used to have, for example, CAF LS50s or CAF R3, that are actually, when you buy them in store, of a similar price to this do-it-yourself project. Yeah, these sound better in every possible area, basically. Compared to LS50, they sound bigger, bolder, much fuller, and they have much greater sense for scale and dynamics. They just sound more authoritative. As I said, I didn't need a subwoofer anymore with these. But more than that, they even have better, more precise sound staging. The sound stage is also deeper and maybe slightly wider, but definitely noticeably deeper. Everything that happens behind the speaker has a new sense of clarity and three-dimensionality. And when I move back to LS50s that I still have, they sound a little bit muddy and flatter. And that's insane because LS50s are actually great in their price bracket. They're great with sound staging. They have really good deep sound stage and they are pinpointing with great precision, but these are doing it better and noticeably so. And after them, LS50s sound a little bit muddy and more shallow, less clean and uh, maybe a touch grainy in the mid range and in highs where these are just squeaky, squeaky clean. And if I talk about dynamics, LS50s are much more dynamically compressed. They, they sound much flatter when these have much bigger swings and just they go about rhythm and dynamics with much more ease. And then if we move to bigger and more capable CAF R3, those are darker than LS50s, but have greater dynamics. Still, they sound, when directly compared with Spirit Winds, they simply sound muddy and unresolving. And not in a sense that you lack high frequencies or anything like that, but uh, simply when you hear the same tone, you can imagine whatever you want, a trumpet, a guitar, a bass guitar, a drum, when you hear any tone through spirit wind and how clean it is and how clean its aftertone is and tone decay with like extremely dark and clean background and then you go back to R3, all of that sounds a little bit hazier and muddier and aftertones are not as clean, not as easily observable they last uh, shorter in time. It feels like there is a muddier main tone, less noticeable, less clearly noticeable after tone that lasts shorter in time. So the whole sound is a little bit more dull and less resolving. Then next, if I would compare these to Dyne Audio Focus 160 that I had in a two different occasions in my own system. And uh, probably tonally speaking, they are closest to Spirit Winds. They also have slightly laid back, uh, more spacious sound staging than both CAFs. Uh, CAFs are more forward. Uh, Spirit Winds remind me more on a Dyn Audio, but 
Spirit Winds are doing that with more authority. Their dynamic swings and dynamic scale is, is definitely bigger and better. And once again, the sound staging is more capable. There's deeper and cleaner and just better resolved and better pinpointed sound stage. So as time go by, I will basically compare them with more and more speakers. And I have high hopes that they'll fare really well because, for example, one of my friends that made uh, a pair of these Spirit Winds for himself told me when I asked him how, did, uh, how do they compare, in his opinion, to Sonus Faber Electa Amator 2 that he also had listened for the extensive period of time and he said Amator 2 cannot compare with Spirit Winds. It's less resolving, it's narrower sounding, it's just not as good of a speaker. He says that he was really keen on comparing these with Martin Duke, for example. He thinks that that would be a good, you know, competition, good test for these speakers. But until I have listened to any speakers of that level in my own setup in a really familiar environment, I cannot say exactly at which level Spirit Wind sits. But what I can tell you at this moment right now is that they definitely sound superior to Kef LS50s, to Kef R3s, and to Dyne Audio Focus 160. And uh, I would probably have to look at Kef Reference 1, Dyne Audio Confidence, the smallest stand mounter one, or something like that, to actually uh, really gauge performance of Spirit Winds and how far they can reach. But given that uh, my costs were 2000 euros and of course many of labor hours into assembling them, oiling them, and just thinking about all of that, getting all the parts, it took me like half a year. But most of that time was because of the woodwork shop that just prolonged, they took their sweet time with building these cabinets. But yeah, a lot of effort and time and love were put into these speakers. And I might not really be objective here, but I love the result. I love the sound. I'm really glad that we had such a great speaker designer as Jeff Bugby was. And at the same time, I'm so sorry that he's not with us anymore, but his designs will live on. Conclusion of this all is that I'm very happy in the end that I had a courage to do this, to do this do-it-yourself project that, that's not cheap by any means. Doing your own do-it-yourself project at this level, spending this much time and money, you expect, you should expect really, really good results. I hope that I've satisfied your curiosity about Spirit Winds that you have been seeing in the previous videos behind me or next to me and asking about them a lot. So that would be all for today. See you next time. Bye. Mm -hmm.